<laughs> Let's start there. <laughs> Get the shoe. You got the shoes? Oh, <laughs> this is a series inspired by my new song, Used to Be Young, where I am going to start at the beginning of my life in 1992 until now in 2023, and we're gonna go through the last 30 years. I got nowhere to be, bitch. <laughs> <laughs> we're looking at top 100 country songs in 1992. When I was born, my dad had the number one country song. When I see the numbers, I just see the humans behind it enjoying the music. And I just see people in numbers. My dad grew up the opposite of me. So I think that's where me and my dad's relationship to fame and success is wildly different. Him feeling loved by a big audience impacted him emotionally more than it ever could me. When he feels special or important, it's like healing a childhood wound. And I've always been made to feel like a star. It makes me emotional. So I think that's the difference. <sighs> it got me. Can you feel the southern rain? Oh my God. I do have a lot of great memories singing music with my dad and learning like and absorbing. And I think I can see my wheels turning and watching his voice and the way that he's using the instrument. I will say that I feel vocally my dad was underappreciated. There's Tish working it. <laughs> yes. Now married to Letitia Finley Cyrus, the mother of his young daughter, Billy Ray has a whole new lease on life. Miley is actually destiny hope. When I found out I was going to have a little girl, I, I just felt there again inside my intuition that it was going to be this little girl's destiny to bring a lot of hope to the world. And she loves to dance, and the more people clap for her, the, the more she'll dance, and I think she's got the Cyrus virus. Well... I'm just grateful that that was projected into the universe before I even could fathom what that meant. There's gratitude for that being the energy that was attached to my vessel because it became a reality. Here's me in my bunk on the tour bus. I don't know what I got back here, but some sort of like hoardings the fans have <laughs> thrown onto the stage and I'm collecting, which I still do. I keep it all. I got 21 storage units to prove it. You better work. Now here's me at a cheer competition. I think the reason why I love cheerleading so much is it just taught me about hard work and dedication and you only get out what you put in. Foundationally, it laid out the road for me to follow later in my career. I always like having a coach. I like having someone to respect and someone to look up to. My mentors are everything to me. The people that have already done what I've done and can give me the cheat codes, I rely on them like Dolly or Joan or Stevie. And it's a reason to get glam. Mm -hmm. I mean, beating the mug. I like my sports pretty, okay? <laughs> Traveling as a cheerleader really set me up for touring. Like the show or the competition may only be a day and that's what people don't really understand about touring is the show is only 90 minutes, but that's your life. If you're performing at a certain level of intensity and excellence, there should be an equal amount of recovery and rest. There's a level of ego that has to play a part that I feel gets overused when I'm on tour. And once that switches on, it's hard to turn it off. And I think when you're training your ego every single night to be active, that's the hardest switch for me to turn off. Having every day the relationship between you and other humans being subject and observer isn't healthy for me because it erases my humanity and my connection. And without my humanity, my connection, I can't be a songwriter, which is my priority. You ever seen a girl that's been on tour for two years? They come back with facial hair. I'm telling you. I'll tell you right now, I got dermaplane when I was on Banger. We get it from Miley, but we got ZZ Top. <laughs> You're gonna love this one. Is this I guess I would have been like one or two. Oh yeah, and I have my Willie Nelson doll, 
which is so creepy because I would introduce him as my boyfriend. So that little monster in the stroller, that's Willie Nelson. That's Miley's boyfriend is Willie Nelson and how... <laughs> Where's the freaking iPad? <laughs> Me, Ruthie, Wilbur Freely, and the Price Brothers. Yeah, so I was in the movie Big Fish. First if acting gig, Tim Burton, no big deal. Edward, don't. You make soap, buddy. How many times did we practice that on the drive to Alabama? <laughs> I was saying the other day, I think that's how I know so much music is that me and my mom were in the car together listening to music all the time. There's still a Merle Haggard tape in the Lexus when we go home with a bumper sticker that says, Smile, God loves you while she was driving like a bat out of hell, <laughs> listening to girls, girls, girls. Yep. This is the Mandela effect, where I have believed my entire life that I was in a baked bean commercial, but it was really a chicken pot pie. Oh my gosh. <laughs> but I didn't like vegetables, and they put vegetables in the biscuit, which I had never heard of, and it honestly, it's You're like, what is sacrilegious. <laughs> And they put the veggies in, so I had a spit bucket underneath my feet, and I was spitting it out every single take. Yeah. And my mom was mortified. This is the audition that got her picked from over a thousand others. Barbara Walters. Of Hannah. So come and take some time and dance with me. Ow! And you it's your red sweater, but you got So in 2004, when I was in middle school, I started the auditioning process for Hannah Montana. And originally I wasn't auditioning for Hannah. I was auditioning for the best friend Lily and they wrote back and asked if I could put myself on tape as Hannah, who's obviously, my name wasn't Miley. I was auditioning for Chloe. And they had already cast a lot of the other characters. And so I was too small and too young to fit in with that group that they had already casted. And so then they filmed a pilot without me about a year had gone by, I just kept cheerleading, kept going to school, and then they called back and said that they wanted to give me another chance now that I had grown up and I came to LA to prove to them that I had grown up. And I had braces on like the only six teeth that I had. So after I had been cast, it was time for them to bring the dads in to audition. And the casting agent had said, your dad is so cute, it would be amazing if he could actually play your dad on the show, but we don't know if that's actually possible. My mom stepped in and said we had been apart as a family for so long because of the show he was doing in Toronto that she would try to make it work and get him to California out to audition. And we did. And here's a video of us doing our handshake. And the rest is her story. She's got friends and oh yeah, she's got a huge secret. <laughs> What the world doesn't know is, Miley Stewart is Hannah Montana. Okay, so this is a good time to tell the story about the concert. Are you gay? I can hit it. Two, three, four. So this was my first concert, besides ever just performing with my dad of my own. But no one knew who I was and no one knew what the songs were either. That would be the concert that was played in the title sequence of the show and used as projecting that Hannah Montana was the biggest star in the world when really I was just a kid with four teeth from Nashville. <laughs> this is a schedule. 5.30 a.m. I'm probably like 12 or 13. Friday, January 5th, 5.30 a.m. Hair and makeup in my hotel. 7 a.m. we get picked up. 7.15. I'm on the news. 7.45, I have another live interview. 8.15, another interview. 8.45, another interview. 9.30 to 11 a.m., meeting with editors. Back to the hotel. Okay, I have to do an interview, but the reporters are all fifth grade students. 1 to 2.30, me and my dad have a lunch interview. 2.40, we have to go to the Life Magazine photo shoot. 3 to 5, interview and photo shoot for the Father's Day issue. Arrive at 6 p.m. for Kids Online interview. Then at 6.15, we have another interview. <laughs> then the next day starts at 7 a.m. and ends at 7.30 p.m. When I fly home to probably go to Hannah, that's on a Saturday. And then Monday, be back at work in the morning. I'm a lot of things, but lazy ain't one of them. That, that truly was the next four years of your life. Yeah. So 
I do think this girl deserves a little endless summer vacation. Me too, honey. So this is the album cover for my first solo record as Miley. The smartest thing to do was to put it on a double disc so Hannah would be on the other side because at the time I wasn't valued in the way that Hannah was, that the magic was more in her. And so this was a way that we could help people put the two and two together that really the voice behind Hannah was always me. If you haven't seen the finale of Hannah Montana, sorry to blow it for you. The Meet Miley Cyrus record was really where I started writing my own songs as a solo artist. And so I was working with a producer in Malibu that lived in a house in Ramirez Canyon, which I would have never known 15 years later. I would be living in that house, which would eventually burn down. So that house had so much magic to it that ended up really changing my life. I got work, work, work. I was trying to get all the clean. <laughs> Hannah's for kids. Miley's for grown ass men in heels. See You Again was a song that I had written on the Meet Miley record. I have my own name in the song. I say my best friend Leslie in the song. And so this was really the beginning of me storytelling for my fans. My record label at the time didn't think the song was a hit. So there was never a music video made for it. I wrote that song in a way that would feel really personal to Miley so there would be no confusion between me and the character. But yes, my record label told me that this song wasn't gonna be a hit and my fans decided otherwise. It's always been us. There. We gotta go there. 2008. 2008. Everyone knows the controversy of the photo but they don't really know the behind the scenes which is always much more meaningful. My little sister Noah was sitting on Annie's lap and actually pushing the button of the camera, taking the pictures. My family was on set and this was the first time I ever wore red lipstick because Patty Dubroff, who did my makeup, thought that that would be another element that would divide me from Hannah Montana. This image of me is a complete opposite of the bubblegum pop star that I had been known for being and that's what was so upsetting. But really, really brilliant choices looking back now from those people. Here's me sandwiched between Beyonce and Rihanna. What I remember most from doing this performance is I was standing in between two of the biggest legends and icons that I was looking up to at the time and they treated me like a little sister the entire time. They were being really sweet. I got brackets on the back of my teeth and I'm singing with Beyonce. Rihanna gave me this choreo. Ah, I live. This is singing at the Obama inauguration for the children. So I was singing The Climb. And at that time, being a part of that moment in history and having a song about inspiration, it was such a hopeful time for so many people. It's an honor to be a part of that experience. I think those girls smoke weed now, so call me. Oh my God. <laughs> We have to make one of these. What's up? That's my crew working on the hoedown throwdown. That's the big dance number in Hannah Montana, the movie. This was the original, kind of like a TikTok dance. Jamal Sims, that hat is criminal. Honestly, my zipper jeans aren't doing anything for me either. This picture has become a meme where it says, be the Miley of your friend group. If you guys didn't know I was bisexual from this damn picture, I don't know what's wrong with you. What? I mean, hello? Look at him. I literally think we were leaving the Grammys to go to the Cheesecake Factory. Me and Emily Taylor Swift and Demi Lovato are going to the Cheesecake Factory. These are some classy ladies. <laughs> In 2008, I needed to do another feature film for Disney and I didn't want it to be a part of Hannah Montana. Once we had written the screenplay, it was time to audition all the guys who would play Will, my boyfriend, in the movie. And we had gotten it down from thousands to the final three. And Liam was a part of that final three. I think one of the elements that made that movie 
feel so special was it was watching two very young people fall in love with each other, which was happening in real time and in real life. So the chemistry was undeniable. And that was the beginning of a long 10 year relationship. I'm just your average teen with 250 individual hair extensions. Performing her brand new summer hit, Party in the USA, for the first time ever, here's Miley, Miley Cyrus. Cyrus. So, I had cut Party in the USA and I was doing my first performance for the Teen Choice Awards. My mom was like, I think it'd be really cool if she was in the trailer park, because that's where we really do come from. So, apparently, me dancing on an ice cream cart with a stripper pole, but it wasn't a stripper pole, it was actually just for stability. Yeah. I had a heel on. Yeah. Guys, what did you want from me? Was I really gonna do my performance without dancing on top of an ice cream cart? That performance was amazing. It was sick. My pitch is honestly a little off and the hat needed to go. But besides that, is Miley turning into the next Britney? Hopefully, if God is good, <laughs> which we know she is. <laughs> What's the new Twitter called, X? Yeah, the rumors are true. I deleted my Twitter. Huh? Can you believe it? No more Twitter. This was backstage no, on tour, and I wrote this in the bus. I want my private life private. I want my private life private. <laughs> Mom, how did they get this video of you out in the parking lot? <laughs> It was actually Salvia though, which is way crazy. So this is from the final episode of Hannah Montana. The drama. Wow. This is how I say goodbye to everyone now. Wow, wow, yeah, yeah. <laughs> This next chapter that we're going to go through together, we're gonna go from 2013, 14 to today. A lot has happened. <laughs> Mom, she said this is when we started pumping up the party. I did it. Yeah. She is out of. <laughs> is it not too much? Can you give me that coffee? <laughs> it's about to get good. Level. I'm going to. <laughs> we're gonna start at We Can't Stop. Okay. Cutting off the ankle bracelet and putting in the grills. Someone at my label had said there's a new kid named Mike Will, and he's only 22 or 23 years old from Atlanta, but he has a song that he's working on, and it didn't have full production or full lyrics or anything, but it was We Can't Stop, and someone played it and said, would you ever want to work with this kid? Even though he's never done anything like this before. He's never been in pop music before. He's only been in hip hop. Would you be down? So then when I went back to LA, me and him met at the Sunset Marquee for the first time. It was immediate chemistry, immediately just all love. And I knew that he was gonna be my partner in crime for that era. And we cut the song, I had cut 23, and I asked Pharrell, who do you think my creative director could be in this era? And I kind of expressed to him what I wanted to do. And he said, there's only one person for you and that's Diane Martell. Me and Diane got on the phone. She's kind of like, what are you up to? What's your life looking like? And I told her about this crazy party that I'd had with my friends. And then she just turned that into the surreal music video that was We Can't Stop. A lot of what I'm wearing is all my own because I just thought after playing a character for so long, the last thing I wanted to do was be somebody that wasn't myself. Then Diane and I came up with the concept for the VMA performance. I'm when serious. you look back at it, you I were mean, mad at a fucking 20 year old dressed as a teddy bear. Sparkin. Wrecking Ball, I had already had the demo and I had taken this song actually to multiple producers who didn't hear its potential and told me they didn't think it fit bangers. So I called a party in the USA guy and go, let's do it again. So at the time when I had made Wrecking Ball, I was expecting for there to be controversy and backlash, but I don't think I expected other women to put me down or turn on me, especially women that had been in my position before. So this is when I had received an open letter from Sinead O'Connor and I had no idea about the fragile mental state that she was in. And I was also only 20 years old, so I could really only wrap my head around mental illness so much. And all that I saw was that another woman had told me that this idea was not my idea. And even if I was convinced that it was, it was still just 
you know, men in power's idea of me and they had manipulated me to believe that it was my own idea when it never really was. And it was, and it is, and I still love it. Our, you know, younger childhood triggers and traumas come up in weird and odd ways. And I think I had just been judged for so long for my own choices that I was just exhausted. And I was in this place where I finally was making my own choices and my own decisions. And to have that taken away from me deeply upset me. God bless Sinead O'Connor for real in all seriousness. The Bangers tour was an investment in myself. A lot of these ideas were kind of so outlandish that no one really wanted to support me in making these pieces. And so I had big puppets, oversized beds. I came out of my own face on my tongue. And this was me and Diane Martell. This was our full vision once again. She goes like, "What? how would you want to end this concert? Like the show is so big, how do you end it? And I wanted to end it in a Truman Show reference. So I flew out on a giant hot dog, obviously, and I left through all the clouds and the exit sign the way that Jim Carrey does because I felt like the Truman Show was really a reflection of my life. I didn't make a dime on this tour because I wanted the to be excellent and when everyone kept saying why are you doing this you're gonna do like a hundred shows and you're not gonna make any money I said there's no one I would rather invest in than myself so I paid for it all to make it exactly what I thought I and the fans deserved so Wrecking Ball receives the biggest honor of the night at the VMAs it gets video of the year and I had just seen Marlon Brando kind of forfeit his Oscar and use that platform to highlight um, some activism that was important to him and I wanted to do the same thing. And so I started my own foundation, Happy Hippie, because I didn't think that it made sense for there to be so much homelessness, especially with young people. And we're having nights like the VMAs where people are in black cars and diamonds and designer clothes and all celebrating each other like we had done something that actually mattered. Felt like Jesse's voice would have been much more impactful to give him my one minute on stage and let him have the mic and him take the platform to highlight an issue that was really important to me because it was happening right in my area. I wanted to highlight that issue. All right, so speaking of the VMAs, 2015, I hosted and ended the night with a performance announcing my new free album that I made with the Flaming Lips. My project was called Miley Cyrus and Her Dead Pets. It was all inspired by animals that I had lost. And so my band dressed as all my dead pets. And we closed the show with about 40 top drag queens. So this is psychedelic rock heroes, the Flaming Lips with 40 drag queens. Cause there's nothing more rock and roll. So we had gone to the finale of RuPaul's Drag Race and we saw the House of Edwards. They performed this dance and I had to know it. And so to get them to come over and teach it to me, we did a remix of Dead Pets. This is one of my favorite performances of all time. Alyssa Edwards is filming All Stars and they let her off set just to come do this performance. Funny Diane Martell story. She said that she still knew how to do a death drop. She did it in my driveway and broke her ankle. This is when I was hosting the VMAs and this was one of the scenes that I had written because I knew I really wanted a couple of things in the show. I wanted the flaming lips. I wanted drag queens. I wanted my grandma and I wanted my pig in the show. So Snoop Dogg was the perfect kind of like connection. It's my grandma doing what grandmas do, baking cookies, but what she doesn't know is that they were actual edibles. RIP, she'll never know. Oh, except on the rod there, cause I'm bringing mom to the set and they give her her apron. Why does this say, my name's not Mary Jane. <laughs> what did you say? I was like, I don't know mom. These Mary Jane brownies are strong. Where'd you get them? I made them with an OG, an old granny. Specifically, yo mammy. Mammy? Flour and cocoa. Special ingredient. And bake. So that was really fun. Bradley, who is a very important part of my life and my career. This is the beginning of me and Bradley. You gotta start somewhere. This is Bradley, just as a double-headed rainbow, with Wayne Coyne, me, Sharon, Galt and Pamela Anderson. But then Bradley also started doing all of my set design. That's how it really started. Bradley made this piano for me all out of my hair. 
<laughs> yeah, all the picture frames are also made out of my hair. And then got- There's my Pablo the Blowfish that died, Twinkle, who the song was about. This was Diane Martell's cat, so I wrote this about Twinkle. And that's Floyd, my dog that had died. And this is my favorite performance I've ever done on SNL, ever. Um, this is me performing the Twinkle song. I had a dream, but what does it mean? Honestly, sweet baby Lauren for letting me do that. I mean, Lauren literally has like every iconic, legendary performer ever come out and perform their big hits. And I had convinced him somehow that I was going to come out naked and sing a song to Diane Martell's cat. Not even my own cat. What does it mean? What does it mean? What does it mean? I dream. This is as serious as it can be me getting Ariana Grande in onesies performing in the backyard. I was flirting with her, and she was a little, she was a little scared. We were having fun. Ariana's a real friend. There's never been a time where I've asked her to do something that was important to me that she didn't come through, and same thing for me with her. This is the Malibu music video. It was really important that the video be as intimate as the record was itself. I had written and recorded all the songs at my Rainbow Land Studios that I had at my Malibu house. In 2005, I recorded my first album at that house. And eventually that would become my house where I would write the Younger Now album and Malibu. And it would eventually burn down. And that's my house and that's my dog Emu. That was the house before and that was the house that burnt down, which all that was left was the love letters. Please. <laughs> I'm begging you, please don't do this to me, please. I was filming Black Mirror, and while I was there, the Woolsey fires happened in Malibu, and I was in South Africa, but it was taking place in Malibu. So it was just a real trip. Like probably two or three years later after this happened, I didn't understand, but I would have this anxiety attack with a vision attached that I would be strapped down to a gurney. So I would have these dreams anytime I would go to perform, and I thought that was just an anxious vision that made no sense. But actually, as my house was burning down, I was strapped to a gurney with my hands locked in handcuffs, strapped to a bed. Found out that my house had burnt to the ground. This was the next day. The show must go on. So, I just want to slow down. I have to slow down because this is like actually serious. So Glastonbury was in June, which was when the decision had been made that me and Liam's commitment to being married just really came from, of course, a place of love first because we've been together for 10 years, but also from a place of trauma and just trying to rebuild as quickly as we could. The day of the show was the day that I had decided that it was no longer going to work in my life to be in that in that relationship. So that was another moment where the work, the performance, the character came first. And I guess that's why it's now so important to me for that to not be the case, that the human comes first. Every bit of trauma in my life, when my grandfather, who I was really close with, died when I was on set, I finished the scene and dealt with that later. During Black Mirror, when the house is burning down, I finished my work and I dealt with it later. On Glastonbury, when that happened, I finished and dealt with it later. Now I don't have that anymore because of the pandemic. I've always been able to work literally through everything. And now the only thing that I know to do in a traumatic experience, like the world shutting down for a global pandemic, is create a show that can keep me performing for my fans. So then I create Bright Minded, which was all about optimism and I got to write all the songs. If you wanna be bright minded, there's just one place to go. I had Elizabeth Warren, I had Selena Gomez, Elton John, Kerry Washington. And so I made the record Plastic Hearts. Life had gotten really hard for me, which makes sense that I would make a record that was very hard and tough. But I made this persona and this kind of alter ego of myself, which was hard and at the time I had said to my therapist you know I feel like I'm hardening up and he said life is hard so that would make sense so I was wearing leather and studs and when I shot this album cover it was with Mick Rock and he had said this might be the last rock album that I ever photograph and it was 
So when I was in South America, after getting my plane was struck by lightning, it was really scary. And when we landed, the first person that I called was Taylor Hawkins to ask him if he thought that I should actually continue flying to the next show because he was already where we were going. Next day or the day after, I woke up to the news that he had passed away, that he had overdosed. So during the pandemic, we were actually locked down in the same neighborhood. We became really close. I would go to his house. He taught me all the Chrissy Hine songs on the drums. I would go over and play the Pretenders with him every night. He would have me dance around to Brass in Pocket with that wireless headset while he would sing along. I knew that he, of all people, would want me to still perform through the pain. So I dedicated the song uh, Angels Like You to Taylor Hawkins at the show in South America. This, I can't even introduce it because it's too fucking iconic. On New Year's, as it's turning 2023, I had used the show um, to announce that Flowers, my first single off In the Summer Vacation was coming. It was just the perfect setup for a song like Flowers that was kind of doing what I had been doing all along, which was taking past pain and trauma and converting it into something optimistic and celebratory that was the idea behind the video, was to show strength and power, um, even through heartbreak. And that's how flowers happen. And this gets us here. Used to be young is my newest single. And I wrote the song about two years ago and have been producing it ever since because as I was going through my own metamorphosis and evolution, the song had to grow and shift with me. It's optimistic and there's a sadness. It's allowing sadness and joy to be happening simultaneously, which happens all the time. Like when you're going through heartbreak and you're performing at Glastonbury, I'm broken hearted, but I'm really fulfilled. And both of those things are allowed to be simultaneously happening. Take one, pour it out, it's not worth crying about the things you can't erase. This, one of one, custom Margiela by Galliano himself. This has a vintage 1970s Mickey Mouse t-shirt underneath, which I thought would be getting the point across of what the song was really about, but also allowing all the other layers of my life and career to be just as important. And it's super emotional because I am kind of a mini me of my mom. And so I could see her inside of the camera by using a technology where I could live stream with my mom from inside of the camera so we could see each other. And as she was dancing with Stephen Galloway, it just made me cry, it made me laugh, it brought up so many real emotions. And I think it's really letting people in to true emotion, which I don't feel we get to see very much these days. We just, you know, looked at all the past, but more importantly, this song is about looking towards the future and where I'm going. So that's what I feel that the song represents. I know it used to be crazy, messed up, but God, was it fun? I know it used to be wild. That's cause I used to be young. Thank you for taking this journey with me for the past 30 years, and I hope to take you along with me for the next 30. Thank you. Most gratitude and appreciation for everything that you have made a reality. All of my dreams have come true because of my fans and I'm deeply grateful. Thank you. That's cause I used to be young.